Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Wald as we are calling our readings through the deathbed of, uh, edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to the last poem of the Whispers of Heavenly Death cluster, Pensive and Faltering. Now I find this interesting because of the title Whispers of Heavenly Death. We certainly heard of whispering in the last couple of poems. Now notice it's pensive and faltering. There's not a sense of so much confidence as one might even say a little bit of uncertainty. Why is it that Whitman would end his cluster with this poem? Well, it's fun to go back and to look at all of the previous clusters and to see how does he end each of those. So for example, go back and look at 52, A Song of Myself, and compare it to this. Or the last poem of Autumn Rivulets, and on and on we could play this game. It's fascinating to see how he sets these poems up. We're going to obviously want to pay attention to it. Now our assumptions, speaking of our earlier study is that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Waldar playlist, from the very first clusters and the very, the very first um, um, put, bringing together of a collection of poems with the last poem, all the way up to and including we've given a set of introductory comments to Whispers of Heavenly Death. I'm hopeful that you've watched that. And as well, we just finished with Plowman Plowing. Now, as we are often want to do, we will turn to our Nortons to get our, uh, la our, our information here on this last poem. We're told that this is the last of the five numbered poems first printed in the London Broadway Magazine, October 1868. This remained unchanged in the present group and is the 1871 passage to India in Lisa Grass 1872 and in Two Rivulets of 1876 and in the final Lisa Grass 1881. Pertinent here again is the concluding comment in the note on plowing as we just finished it, this, al uh, this allegory, this analogy of somehow planting seed is the life and then harvesting the seed, i.e. leaves of grass, is death. Now, you'll remember that pensive, first used in starting from Pominach 9, what do you seek so pensive and silent? You'll remember that. Pensive gets used 19 times in Lisa Grass. I think it's a powerful uh, word to reference the epistemological fallibilism of Whitman, as we've commented in earlier lectures. The fallibilist position epistemologically, epistemology, what can you know? And for Whitman, it's, I, I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. He very rarely in Lisa Grass is an absolutist epistemologically, I'm right, you're wrong. And he's very rarely a, a, a true relativist. There is no way to know, absolutely no way to know. But he certainly is a fallibilist. I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. And this word pensive kind of captures that. Faltering gets used one and only one time in Leaves of Grass, and it's right here in this poem, which I find fascinating. It is has this sense of, of not being totally sure, totally confident. Let's enjoy this little five-line offering that will finish Whispers of Heavenly Death. Pensive and faltering, the words, the dead, I write. For living are the dead, happily the only living, only real, and I, the apparition, I, the specter. Now, I find this a remarkable way to finish this cluster, Whispers of Heavenly Death. After this poem, there is exactly 130 poem titles left in Leaves of Grass. And the clusters that will follow after two poems, starting with Starry, Starry Night, all of them will begin to play the game of Whitman coming to terms with his own death. Much of his health will be destroyed through the experience of being the nurse, go back to wound dresser and uh, drum test. And he will never be the same again. He's got to come to terms with all that. I think this poem serves as a remarkable ending for Whisper's of Heavenly Death, but it gets us ready for, for sure, the first and second annex poems, as we will call it, especially with Farewell. Notice it begins with, pensive and faltering, the words, the dead, I write. And then it hits us. Oh, what he's pensive about is calling anyone dead. What he's faltering about is writing the dead. In other words, he doesn't like the idea of writing dead to somehow capture what exactly it is that's going on when a person dies. Why? Because for him, death is not the end. This is his theodicy, as we have said so many times, the answer to the question, why must we have death? And his answer is, Man, I'm, not, I'm kind of pensive and faltering about wanting to claim that when you die, that's the end of it. 
Notice then the phraseology of the third line. For living are the dead. I'm fascinated that he doesn't use the article the before the word living. Now some of you will argue I'm reading too much into this here. But wouldn't you really write the living are the dead? That would make the most sense. And yet notice here, for living are the dead. And I think his refusal to use the, the article the here brings more into focus his use of the word living and saying living is dying. Living are the dead. Taking us obviously back to the word picture of plowman plowing, right? And then in parenthetics, notice the last two poems in Whispers of Heavenly Death both end with these parentheses, these asides as we might see it. I think he learned a lot of this from his study of Shakespeare. He says happily, we've seen this word in Leaves of Grass, happily the only living, only real, and I, the apparition, you'll remember this from of the terrible doubt of appearances, apparition, phantom was mentioned earlier in uh, Whispers of Heavenly Death, I, the specter. Now, I find it interesting that he finishes with this word specter. Do you remember Song of Myself passage 2 and at the very end of that, he said it this way. Stop this day and night with me, and you shall possess the origin of all poems. You shall possess the good of the earth, and sun, there are millions of suns left. You shall no longer take things at second or third hand, nor look through the eyes of the dead, nor feed on the specters in books. You shall not look through my eyes either, nor take things from me. You shall listen to all sides and filter them from yourself. I think his use of the word specter here intentionally is designed to bring us back to this set of lines. In other words, he ends Whispers of Heavenly Death by asking you, what are you going to do with all of the ideas that have been presented in Whispers of Heavenly Death? What are you going to do with the, your views on life and on death, and how do you see them as somehow synonymous at the end of these 18 poems that have been orchestrated, I'll use musical language, symphonic in some powerful ways. Whitman asks, what do you want to do now with all of these ideas? I'm hopeful that I can turn them over to you. And he finishes with this word, specter. Now at 2A, I think the powerful message here is the powerful message of all of Whispers of Heavenly Death, that the living are the dying and the dying are the living. At 2B, I love this idea of the last poem in a cluster and how he sets up his reader to get ready to really be challenged. And he does it often in these most almost innocent ways of just kind of a little, you know, a little five-line offering here that's so compelling. Now at 3A, there's a lot of different places we could go. We could say Bryant's Thanatopsis comes to mind. But I want to take us... I want to take us to uh, T.S. Eliot. I've been making the argument for some time that Eliot borrows heavily from Whitman. I was doing some reading of Four Quartets just a few poems ago, and now I'm going to come back to Four Quartets. In this case, the very last lines. Now, if, if Eliot learned anything from Whitman, I think he learned a lot from Whitman. I think he learned how to finish Four Quartets. And I think he looked at, for example, a set of lines like this, to allow him to write the following. Here are the last lines of the four quartets, little giving, of course, five. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Through the unknown, remembered gate, when the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning. At the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall and the children in the apple tree, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard in the stillness between two waves of the sea. Quick now, here now, always a condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than anything. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, when the tongues of flame are enfolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. By the way, he, his use of parenthetics in the set of line, in, in the line costing not less than everything. Again, I think it's just patently borrowings from Walt Whitman, and especially a passage like this that ends with these parenthetics and a sigh. Well, let's go to 3B. 
What are your thoughts about this cluster? If you've been reading every one of these poems and a good number of you have picked up in the middle and then said, I've got to go back and start at the very first word come and I've got to read the deathbed edition of Whitman's Leaves of Grass annotating as I go. And By the time you're here, you now have 130 poems only remaining for the entire deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. We're definitely nearing the end. We're definitely ready to begin to pick up now the final poems but where are you in this cluster of heavenly death? What was your favorite? What was your most powerful images? What was the conflict for you that was created here? And do you find any comfort from these set of poems as we now get ready to move on to Mother with Thy Equal Brood and uh, Pomenoc Picture before we pick up the classic texts um, uh, noon to starry night? I hope that these readings are challenging you and comforting you. Thank you.